Anthony Gwibney. Alice Newgibbon was born in Walkinstown here in Dublin in 1954. She attended University College Dublin where she studied pure English for her BA. She went on to take an MPhil in Middle English and Old Irish. She spent a year studying folklore in the University of Copenhagen as a research scholar. She completed her PhD in 1982 and it dealt with the relationship between oral and written narrative. And it was in that year in college that she married the love of her life, folklorist Bo Almquist. They were married for 30 years until Bo's untimely death in 2013. Two boys, Ragnar and Olaf, were born out of that marriage. You write Eilish in your native English and in Irish. You've won several awards for your writing over the years, the Bisto Book of the Year Award, the Readers Association of Ireland Award, the Stuart Parker Award for Drama, the Butler Award for Prose from the Irish American Cultural Institute, and several Eroctus Awards for novels and plays in Irish and for your children's fiction. Your novel, The Dancers Dancing, was shortlisted for the Orange Prize for Fiction in 2015. You were awarded the Irish Pen Award for an outstanding contribution to Irish literature. And the success has continued, culminating in the launch this week of your latest collection of short stories entitled Little Red. You were elected to Aesthana, the Academy of Irish Writers and Artists, as far back as 2004. And you're president of Uncommon Labellagus Erin, the folklore of Ireland society. There are consistent themes, Eilish, uh, running throughout your life's writing. Uh, and critics have noted your female protagonists who seem to need to confront the personal desires that they have suppressed in the face of larger social expectations in order to generate a livable solution for themselves. And the reader of your fiction won't be surprised to find the realistic characters, so often women struggling through love and loss and sacrifice, woven into a mythological fabric, and perhaps there's no great surprise there. Welcome, Eilish. Thank can you. I ask you first, Eilish, I mean, at, at what age did you first imagine yourself a, a writer? Um, at the age of eight or nine, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is not that unusual, especially among women writers, um, I have found. Um, so, yes, I... I, I I thought I, I was a great reader uh, as a child, and um, and if you read a lot, you you get good at you know I was uh, so I was also I had a I was good at writing, and I would like to say because I was in school between 1959 and 1971, and the, the you know primary and secondary, and it, it, it school was very regimented then and disciplinary and, and we you know you sat at your desk all day and you weren't allowed to talk uh, even when the teacher wasn't in the room which used to happen quite a lot actually mm -hmm. <laughs> they used to only go for a cup of tea or something and say no talking you know you just think what <laughs> I mean who would put up with such a thing yeah. but they were actually very encouraging to me as a writer nobody ever said that's a ridiculous idea or on the contrary, they would um, invite me to write plays. Usually in school, they want to play or something that lots of people can can do. So um, it, 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 it was wonderful. You know, they, it wasn't the dark ages. There were no writers in school or anything, but um, these days we have all sorts of wonderful projects and programs, but, um, Nevertheless, um, there there was no suggestion that this was a silly idea. So it was it was a welcoming world for for somebody. It was, who yeah, aspirations it was yeah. And, yeah. And that school was, as we've said, in Dublin, indeed. And you are a Dublin woman, uh, a born and, and and bred here. And, and we often think of Ireland as being two places: the urban world and the great sort of Western world. There, but but not for you, perhaps. Your your roots go back deep into the country. In fact, as far as the the Irish-speaking areas of Donegal, that's in your background. W was that something that you felt deeply growing up? And feel oh, deeply I, 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 indeed I did. Um, I was, um, my well, my mother was a Dubliner um, like me, but um, my father came from a uh, little Gaeltacht in Donegal, Glenbar, um, on the Fannet Peninsula. Um, it, 
a small Gale thought kind of separated from the big Gale thoughts, mm. even if it was doubly marginalized, you could say. <laughs> and that was um, a, a, a place which meant a huge amount to me as a child. I mean, my dad left it when he was 20. Um, so he lived most of his life in, in in Dublin, also in Scotland, like a lot of Donegal people and England. But it was as if he had a very detailed map of that valley engraved on in his heart and soul and mind. And he talked about it um, a great deal. Um, and he painted a picture of life in his house, he was born in 1912, um, which was exotic and magical, um, totally self-sufficient people. You know, they grew their food, they had obviously cows and they made butter. And And I think what enchanted me most was they they made, they practically grew their own clothes. You know, they sheared the sheep they spanned the wool and mm. um, they it went to the local weaver. A traveling tailor came into the house and made the clothes for winter. I mean, this was a way of life which hadn't changed in Lovely. millennia and it, such a such a wonderful place. And then so it was a land of the imagination, but it was also a place to which we actually went on holidays, although all that had changed then when I was going. But um, still, okay. it was. <laughs> Still, it was rural and um, very different from Dublin in the 1960s and into the 70s. And enchanted is the word that you use there. And indeed, enchantment plays its, 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 its part in so much of your writing, actually, indeed. Do you feel that you are, in some way, that you're writing out of a specifically Irish sensibility? Maybe in a way that some other more modern writers don't do, and maybe particularly have the experience of being an Irish woman in a way that's maybe a little bit more deep than some others. Is, is that too much to... Well, I think I am a modern Irish writer. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but, but, but um, yeah... Um, well, I think um, I, I've been lucky to have uh, a foot or a pen in the two sides of Ireland. As you say, we think of the urban and the rural mm -hmm. always coming closer together now. But um, but I, I, I've also, of course, I'm in the two languages, um, the Irish language and the, the English language. And um, that has been the case with me from childhood. And, you know, I was given the Irish language as a gift from my parents. I never had to learn it or anything like that, which, um, you know, that's a good little gift to give to a child, um, yeah. a, an extra language. And um, so I belong to, um, I'm a hybrid, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I think it does give me an insight. Um, well, for instance, um, w one aspect of life in Ireland um, is that there are two literary communities, at least two literary communities, um, the, the Irish language one and the English, the big English one. And of course, all Irish, all Irish, there is no Irish monoglot, hasn't been for quite a long time. So everyone who's an Irish speaker or an Irish writer has complete access and knowledge of the English side of things, but it's not vice versa at all. And, um, you know, sometimes the Irish language writers, my friends in Aintas and Scrivenory, the Irish language union feel, yeah, marginalised and invisible. Yeah. We're kind of, they're kind of invisible. Yeah, so, marginalised um, in, in, in their own country. I mean, that this they're is marginalised in their own country. Really, really, <laughs> yes, really, it's really it's is. well, you know, Ireland is a, is a it's complex, isn't it? Um, uh, that's how it is. As a, as an Irish speaker, you're marginalised in your own country, even though it's the first national language and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. This this Irishness, however, actually, that, that we're talking about, this deep sense of Irishness and writing out of the, the Irish sensibility, it's never really contained you, I think. Were you always determined to be a pioneer in the, in, in the forms and themes of writings that you chose? I mean, I guess what I'm wondering, was writing an ideological as well as an aesthetic pursuit for you? And I'm thinking here of your adoption of magic realism, your engagement with folklore, but particularly perhaps your early devotion to the cause of women in Ireland. Well, um, 
But no, not really. I mean, when I started, you know, when I was eight or nine, I wanted to be in at Blyton. I, I, I wasn't kind of out to break any bolts. And, and when I started writing a little bit more seriously, um, you know, I studied English. I, I, I didn't even study Irish. Um, I, 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 old, I, I thought literature started with Beowulf. Um, so, um, and, and when I started writing short stories, I was in, which in like 1974 is my first story published. Um, it was heavily influenced by D.H. Lawrence, who was a big, <laughs> was big in UCD uh, at the time. Not a bad influence, mind you. And um, I would have been influenced. I mean, he's a very good writer, so rich. Um, but um, whatever else you think but about him. But, um, <laughs> lots of other things. To think yeah, about. lots of other things. <laughs> um, so, um, no, I would have been, I, I, you know, I was, I, I guess, like any young writer emulating other writers, uh, yeah. him yeah. and... Joyce, uh, obviously in in in, in Dubliners and um, writers who were pop, Margaret Drabble, those right. kind of writers. Right. She, she right. was a big um, in, 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 I loved her when I was, you know, twenty or so. I still right. and I still love her actually. But um, so 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 no, I think um, so. I certainly didn't start with any ideologies or any desire, really, other than to just be a writer, just to write. Lovely, lovely. Um, lovely. But then lovely. I changed. Yeah, um, I. Right. <laughs> um, right. So I'd say sometime in the nineteen eighties, um, mm. I was quite a late um, comer to uh, feminism, I, and 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 so was Ireland, really, in well, a way. You were it, an early <laughs> comer in many senses. You, yeah, you, you yeah, were out there before. Yeah. Well, I, any, 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 anyway, I think for me, um, it, during yeah during the seventies, I was sidetracked. Anyway, I always wrote short some about a short story a year or whatever, but. I certainly didn't focus that much on my writing mm. because I was writing a PhD. I mean, that uh, was really interesting, but also, uh, as as you know, time consuming and all absorbing and uh, drawing on the same kind of energy, I suppose. Sure, sure, um, sure. So um, it was more or less when that was out of the way that I got married. I didn't get married to Boo when <laughs> I was in college. <laughs> so I had to wait. It was a condition. You had to wait until you're right. 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 It was a condition that I would have my PhD. Can you imagine? I see. Really. Married, it, you have an imposed condition, really. Really. Yeah. Really. I mean, <laughs> well, that was fair enough, anyway. An incentive to get it done. And... Um, <laughs> Then I began to write, after when the PhD was done, I started writing and um, uh, trying to get a book out and so on, and I succeeded. But at the same time, um, something called the Women's Studies Forum was set up in UCD, University College Dublin, um, by uh, uh, Alva Smith and other people. And this was the forerunner later that evolved into work, the women's studies program and academic programs in women's studies and that. But at the time, it was sort of a group of academics and writers and people that had been brought together. And we, Alva would invite over um, feminist writers and um, organize readings of women poets and so on. Mm -hmm. And she just opened up um, the, me to the realization that there was something absent uh, largely in Irish letters, namely mm -hmm. human. And, and you I, had, I hadn't really noticed that before. Uh, it, you can have, we can all have such enormous blind spots. Oh. And, and then, um, oh yes, <laughs> well, for instance, <laughs> there has been a few of them around, but um, indeed. indeed. But we didn't hear that much about them, uh, indeed, um, in the universities, and they were not in the canon. And um, it, right. as, as we, you know, in college, when I was there, I, I didn't notice at all that there were only about 
three women writers that we ever read. <laughs> um, yes. Jane Austen, Emily Bronte, uh, Bronte and Emily Dickinson, um, they were the ones. But, um, you know, no Kate O'Brien, no Edna O'Brien, uh, mm -hmm. Nothing like that. So, so this was, this um, was moments of really, really great discovery for you. And, it, was and a, it, was, it was it was it was a road to Damascus moment. It, it was an changed the shape of your writing, yes. and 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 it changed the shape of my writing. You know, it did. Yeah, um, uh, and it gave me something that I think I might have needed, which was a cause. <laughs> well, marvelous, marvelous, yeah. marvelous, marvelous, and you, you, you clearly you ran with that cause. I want to just go continue, just to go back to about those days for a moment, indeed. And and I've been rereading your your memoir, Twelve Thousand Days, published just two years ago, that describes your youth, your university years, your marriage, and very movingly your widowhood. And um, in it, you remind us about the changes that Ireland had gone through. Um, since then, by recalling attitudes towards sexuality enforced on your often guilt-ridden generation. Just remind us, I mean, the different generations who may be watching in here tonight, was Ireland that bad at that time for women? If you, if you can go back. Well, I, 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 I don't want to say Ireland was that bad. I mean, we, we, you know, we had parties and there was music and dancing and... Um, <laughs> falling in love and falling out of love and mm -hmm. lots of fun and um, so uh, I, I I think it's kind of sometimes one can um, paint a picture of uh, you know a country or a, an era which is you know it, it, it's usually that people are going to have a laugh and a good time no matter what it's like so mm -hmm. it's not all uh, dull I, no it's actually it was it was good but um but yeah, I think there was an awful lot of um, the, the puritanical attitude to sex was um, inhibiting and, and I think bad for people. Yeah, that um, you were, well, as, as a woman, um, you would feel, I, well, this is what I felt. Um, and we were, I was in a transitional period. You know, I mean, the sexual revolution had started in 1963 not too late for me, but That's um, <laughs> That's but I wasn't. But 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 too late. But but it came. You know, everything came a little bit later. Um, it, to Ireland, say in those days. Um, so um, but we were still kind of. There's a sexual revolution. There's women's lib. There's this all this stuff going on. But we still don't have contraception, and we're still absolutely terrified of getting right. pregnant. Right. <laughs> so, right. so there's a kind of mixture of sex is wrong because. But I think it's kind of okay. It's wrong, and the punishment is not going to be eternal damnation. It's going to be pregnancy, and right. you must avoid this at all costs. So, yeah, I think I think it was a very uh, inhibiting um, factor. Okay, that was Ireland. As we know, it was like that in, in many, many, many other countries until just a little bit earlier, and it still is like that in other countries now. And in but, issues that you felt compelled to confront within within your stories and your novels and that. So the yes. you know, the condition of women in time was was one of the ideological factors, let's say that oh that you're right. Yes. Well, the condition of women as far as um uh, sexual re re matters, reproductive rights, and so on, are concerned is, right. is one of them. Um, but of course, also the condition of women as far as um, uh, career opportunities, gender mm. equality, in other ways, is concerned. And I think um, I'm I was particularly interested in the condition of women as far as um, equality in the literary world <laughs> was concerned. Yeah. Um, that's um, I may not write that much about it actually, um, but um, of course that was a, that was a huge issue in the eighties and the nineties um, in Ireland in um, among among writers that the, the field day debacle being kind of <laughs> the the the, exam the great example of where right. things were going right. wrong and right. Right. maybe a kind of turning point. And of course, a great plethora of young, fabulous Irish women writers out there at the moment. That must be hugely heart uplifting for somebody like yourself, who's been there in the forefront for such a long time. Yes. 
Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That that it 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 seems to me now everyone wouldn't agree completely mm. with me that the landscape has changed um, for women writers of fiction in particular, mm. and that mm. it it seems to me to be a level and equal playing field now. Um, mm. That there is, I mean, mm. in other genres, the theatre notably. Um, Women are very underrepresented for 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 various reasons, so right. they haven't really um, uh, won the battle as yet. But in the area of fiction, I'm pretty happy with the way things have gone. But but I mean, it was it was a bit of a it was a battle, and um, and it was fought in the eighties um, yeah. by yeah. me and my pals. Good fought and 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 well fought. You know, I want to continue actually just to talk about the past and the present and in a slightly different uh, fashion there, because as well as being a, a writer, you're a teacher. And, and I think you take great pleasure from your teaching and great pride as you're entitled to actually out of your relationships with your students. I mean, in the past and of course, here actually in Boston College at the moment, I, I, I have no doubt. Um, and I wonder if you have in, in, in that period of such extraordinary change in Ireland regarding sexuality and gender roles, marriage, abortion, if you've seen these effects and the, these changes on your students' attitudes, not only in the writing, but also in their responses to Ireland's earlier texts. I mean, here's kind of what I'm wondering. Is the effect of these changes consistently liberating in these days of trigger warnings and new waves of, of caveats? Um, Is that a worry? Is that a... Mm, I'm not... Yeah, I think what I actually t tend to notice um, in my students is that in some ways they are, um, they can be um, more intolerant um, of deviation oh. from certain rules than uh, I would have thought we were it's certainly in fiction. So, well, for instance, um, I always find, I nearly, I frequent, I, I often uh, teach our, our the student, the creative writing students when we're looking at the short story, we read um, classic, iconic texts, canonical texts. So um, I like them to read che Chekhov's The Lady with the Lapdog. And um, I mean, that is about an adulterous affair. Um, mm they are they are they're quite they can be rather very judgmental about the fact ah, <laughs> I right. mean you, you think Chekhov is writing it's emotional truth and um Gorov has finally you know found love but they read it in a different way so I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what that is about I think there there are new um norms yeah um Great, great, great. And perhaps they might become maybe even more acute, more, 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 more evident to you here in your teaching in Boston College than they were in Ireland, perhaps. I'm, I'm just guessing. And indeed, there are questions coming in. But just before we look at them there, I wanted to move to another topic. And again, I'm talking about 12,000 days and um, where you described your grief at the loss of, of your husband of 30 years. And uh, grief, you, you wrote in that, dissolves you. That, that's a huge and, and a very, very beautiful, but a very, very unhappy term. It dissolved you, uh, but you and your writing came back together again. And if, if you don't mind, I mean, can you speak about how that process of what, how, what, how do you come back from that disillusion that so many people have to feel at some point in their lives? And I'm thinking right now when it's so, so, so much around us. Yeah, half the world nearly is going to experience this. Um, so, um, as Penelope Lively says somewhere, it's um, you know it's it's a devastating thing, but it's, it's really normal. It it, it happens. Uh, bereavement, loss of your lover or your spouse or your partner, um, and well, my ex experience of it was that um, I couldn't face. I didn't want to write fiction at all for a couple of years. Um, so I wrote the memoir, I suppose. Um, and that was a kind of magical thinking. I, I, I think Joan Didion's book, The Year of Magical Thinking, really mm -hmm. nails it that um, by writing about the departed lover, you're 
actually you're just trying to stay keep them with you you know um so yeah i mean as long as and also to keep to keep them alive yeah. you know so long you know shakespeare's lines to time so long as men can breathe and eyes can see so long lives this for this gives life to thee i think it's really? that sort of impulse anyway that was what i the only thing i wanted to write so i wrote it um and then i began to come back into writing fiction i i somebody asked me a very good question um at the launch the other day um have women been encouragers of you and in that yes they have been all the time not exclusively but um I, I started writing fiction again because um, somebody asked me to write a story, um, Sinead Gleason, for her anthology, uh, The Long Gaze Back, and Belinda McKeown also for an anthology. And I couldn't write about anything. Um, I was still just, I was mired in grief, but it, that's what was on my mind. And oh. yeah, so um, I wrote a uh, yeah, so the deadline approached. <laughs> um, this is uh, also an incentive. And um, what can I write? What can I write? I can't think of anything. Um, I I just wrote an account of um, walking to the graveyard, which is something I did at that time um, nearly every day. It happened to be not far from my house. And, you know, I, I this is something I tell the students. The stories are just there um just especially go for a walk go somewhere and you may find something so so i wrote it, i just wrote a description of my walk to the graveyard and uh, an account of the graveyard so that's not a story um but um um then i began to work on it and chip away at it the way you do and i found the story in the in the in in the piece that's and good. um and that's a very enjoyable experience. You know, writers, it's not kind of the done thing to say writing is therapeutic, but writing is therapeutic. Right. <laughs> but it is for right. me anyway. And it not just in the sense that, you know, spilling it all out is therapeutic, which it is, as um, uh, Freud and, and many writers, Shakespeare knew very well, but uh, actually the shaping of the, thing, of, the of, of the raw material into a story or some kind of piece of a poem or some kind of art is also th the work is also very therapeutic. Marvelous, and 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 this in your personal experience as you were attempting to what's the opposite of dissolute to re dissolute to undissolute or something, are trying to bring the self back together again. I mean how useful you're saying was telling that story telling any story almost is and and I don't think you're a person who wants to give advice to the world but are we saying even to those who are not writers who are dealing with these difficult times and grief and these issues indeed that to attempt to write to attempt to construct a narrative within their minds is a way to, to pull themselves together. Actually I would say that yeah yeah I think that would be um yeah. a useful um therapy for 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 for, for anybody and um, well i mean give sorrow words the grief that words. does not speak uh, knits up the o'erwrought heart and Marcus. bids it break shakespeare knew it like that's Marcus. freud is saying this uh in in at the end of the 1900s or whatever shakespeare was onto it every writer knows it um the talk cure and the writing cure so i i i would say that and um, and also read um, of, well, you know it. I mean, my first port of call was the library and getting mm. books, other books about you know C.S. Lewis, the Grief Observed, and Joan Didion, and there are various good books where uh, writers, especially, describe what they went through. And somehow they're very, very comforting. 
Um, so and the writing um, cure might have to take the place of the of 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 the talking cure in a way. Because talking, of course, is what we do in Ireland. It's it's what we're kind of good at and whatever else. And I think that we all feel the loss very greatly of just not having that person in front of us to whom we can talk, with whom we can relate, about whom we can we can spill out our lives and tell our stories and tell our, construct a narrative for ourselves. So that is a loss to us all. I wonder about the writer actually in times like this. Their role often being their job being a kind of a solitary and a lonely one anyway. Are, are writers a little bit more likely to survive this world? How are you doing yourself, by the way, might I just ask, actually, in the face of all this? There's been a lot of changes taking place in your own life over the last few months, even apart from COVID. Well, I, 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 um, I suppose um, the, the lockdown and in Dublin and then Ireland, and then I came across the Atlantic and um, I'm not in lockdown here, but and I, I love it. Um, but of course, it's, you know, everyone is living a restricted life. Yes. Um, I think it is easier actually for writers. You know, I'm used to living on my own now also. And um, to, yeah, to, 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 I write and I read and I, I'm uh, kind of happy enough doing that. But I think, um, and, and writing, of course, has the great advantage over so many other um, jobs or careers that you can do it um, on your own in a room if you've got some paper and a pen. One of the reasons women wrote in the were able to write in the old days, the the nineteenth century, you know, the Jane Austens and so on, that mm -hmm. the, you don't you don't need much apart from a bit of time Wonderful. and um, a room of your own if you have it. But I have a house of my own, a big house of my own in Boston, <laughs> so um, I'm kind of privileged um, to put it mildly. Um, I didn't find the, the the lockdown very difficult, but I I am I think maybe um, writers could use the time to reflect on um, what what the whole pandemic means for us as people as as a for the human race for societies and so on. I think perhaps we could be doing that, I, and I don't see too much of that. Um, I think some of the lighthearted writers, like the columnists in, say, the people like Roisin Ingle and so on, um, write about it in a kind of humorous way. But I, 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 I'm not aware of too much serious reflections on do, what do, we do, are do, experiencing. You know, I, I mean, do you see a sort of a dereliction of duty here? I mean, you who some 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 years ago actually stood out there and and made a point. You were you were a political writer. You were somebody who was in the public face and dealing with great issues. And and I presume that appear, that that was coming from a sense of obligation to to other women and to Irish society. Is there a dereliction of duty on the part of writers at the moment? And if so, what does one do about it? Well, I, if so, I'm as guilty of it as the next. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I so, so, and some writers have to, I mean, Rita Ann Higgins has COVID poems, I think, which have, so um, she comes to mind um, and I'm probably... Uh, never, never, never slow to, to, to take on the cause as Rita mm -hmm. Ann, of course. Um, it's just, I, I, I think maybe this pandemic it, it seems to me to be something which is unusual in that um, it's a worldwide phenomenon that affects every single person we're all in you know there's a, it has an impact on all of us some much more dramatically and tragically than others of course but we're all affected by it and um, so I think here we are in a situation where history and the personal simply intersect for every single one of us and I, I i would i would like us to um to think about that and to ponder on you know what are we learning i i mean not about yeah human the hu the hu human condition i don't mean the medical stuff obviously and so on but about what do we really miss um mm -hmm. What is most important? Right. Where right. should we be going? Right. Going from here, I, I, yeah, it's so easy to 
when when I one of the things I did actually at the um, during the initial lockdown when we were all kind of optimistic, I think especially in Ireland there was a good there was there was actually a good community feel and everything people were helping one another and all that. Um, I um, gave some workshops um, for the Irish Writers Centre online, and uh, I thought they were uh, that that was a helpful thing to do for people. Um, I I I I know it. I know it was uh, like these meetings. I mean, some of the online events are really just great. They structure weeks for people. They provide them with some sort of uh, you know with a social they're sociable um, sure silver linings when, the, when they're very badly needed yeah. i'm delighted to hear you speak of the irish writer center what a, what a marvelous organization what a really fabulous work they do for young upcoming writers and so many others you know there are a lot of other questions that i want to ask you just about your own writing and things but let's for a moment i, I just want to go back to michael crone my, my 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 colleague over there hello mike how are you and i think maybe you've got some questions and some questions coming in do you want to just take it for I do, Irish. Um, I'm going to combine one from Suzanne Marston and one from Oliver Rafferty. Um, going back to the bilingualism issue, uh, Oliver says, does your pen flow easier in, English, in Irish or English? And does Irish give a dimension not present in your English prose? Mm -hmm. Which kind of echoes what Suzanne said, which was, do you feel like you're a somewhat different writer in Irish than English? If mm -hmm. so, how would you characterise the difference? Um well, the answer is yes. I'm different in Irish um, in, uh, from English. Um, English is my I'm bilingual, but bilingual people always one language is stronger. And for me, English is the language that was the language which is, which is stronger. So it flows more easily in English. In when I'm writing in Irish, it always takes me a little while to get into the flow, but then I do. Um, I write more simply um, because my vocabulary is more limited in Irish. Um, I, um, I've also generally in my, in my Irish um, books um, and plays, books um, written in, in genres that are different from the genres I write in, in English. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, so maybe in a way I'm kind of more experimental in one sense in Irish. So there's kind of a, 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 a freedom about it to let the imagination go. And um, yeah, I started, I, I started writing in English. Um, I, di I didn't write in Irish until I was, you know, I had three or four books behind me in English. And then again, somebody asked me to write something, uh, Cleana Neon Loon, who was director of Arkland Hija in Dublin in the 19, mid 1990s, was looking for a woman who could write Irish and who was a writer. So I ticked these boxes, even though I hadn't actually written much in Irish or anything. And she wanted somebody to write a play, which I also hadn't written since I was in you know, fourth class or something. So, um, but I did that and it worked out and then it kind of went on from there. Um, my second work was um, a detective novel in Irish, uh, Dunbaru Sedangan, which I think it might be true to say started a bit of a trend for detective novels in Irish and um, which was taken up by some other um, very good women writers, in fact, um, and um, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I write in a, a lighter way, mo mostly in Irish, not not absolutely always. So it's different. Is that the question answered? Okay, <laughs> wonderful. And then from Martina uh, Devon, um, you mentioned a battle had to be fought in the 1980s for literary quality. Were any of the male writers, publishers, editors, reviewers, and so on particularly helpful or unhelpful during this process? <laughs> well, I, I, I can't say that they were um, directly unhelpful. You don't have to name um, names, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh well, it's no good without the names. Absolutely. I mean, um, I, mean I, I, I mean, on the positive side, I would say um, that um, one of the greatest um, encouragers and enablers of 
women writers as well as men writers, but enough, he encouraged an awful lot of, was a man, David Marcus, um, for, mm. with his new Irish writing page in the Irish um, uh, press, um, went on to move to the, tri- the Tribune and then to, in now, it's, now it's in the uh, Sunday Independent or Irish Independent, um, yes. Martina, we know this has just happened. Um, yeah. But... Um, the, the the literary editors um, in the 80s, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, were, were men. I mean, it was, uh, say, John Bandler in the Irish Times, I think. And um, we, we know from the statistics that um, books by women were, were not reviewed um, as, as, as often, um, that there weren't very many women reviewers of books and so on. So um, that 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 changed um, as as time went on. But um, it it did require some um, some uh, act- activism and agitation from the sidelines by by women um, and letters to the editor and so on and so forth. Um, I think I wrote one or two of those um, in those days um, and 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 gradually the that that changed up certainly up to a point um, so so yeah I, I I couldn't I will I, I won't I won't name names but there was uh, I, I, I don't think you know when Shane Steen said when the field anthology came out in 1991 and there was a big Ferrari and um, heard him a book about the absence of women poets in the contemporary poets section and um, he said sorry we just forgot or <laughs> words to that effect we didn't notice and that was I just believed him I mean I don't think it's a good excuse but I think there was just this blind spot that they just didn't notice and until you start noticing and and actually during the songs and saying, okay, so there are um, ten books reviewed this week and in the newspaper, and nine of them are by men, and eight of the reviewers are men. Uh, you 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 have to get into almost quotas at a certain point, and that has not it. Yeah, things have changed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so I suppose leading on from the eighties, a question from Leanne Lane. Um, do you think that the new women writers today, and she puts down Neve Campbell, Neve Dolan, and Sally Rooney, are too concerned to write within a paradigm of girl meets boy, girl meets contemplated man, but girl always de- defines her life around a man? I think that's okay. You know, I mean, these are these are young women, and um, when you're like. All through my 20s, my whole life was about um, meeting men, losing men, blah, blah, blah. I, 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 I like, um, say, Sally Rooney's writing because she goes deeply into the emotions um, that a young woman feels. Um, so, mm. and I think, mm. you know, Fiction is the history of emotion, and um, so that's that's what it's all about. Um, there are other topics to write about, of course, and um, and 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 other writers do write about them. But um, I, I'm I'm I think that's okay. Yeah, I, and in fact, I think it's probably right. I think you really, um, as a young writer or an old writer. Um, unless you're writing about something that um, is of deep concern to you yourself, um, unless you're um, encountering experience for the millionth time to try and understand it, um, unless it's unless it's you, it's not going to be any good really to anybody. So if if what your life is about is um, love and um, with men or women or whoever it's with, that's what you should be writing about. I mean, there'd be time to write about um, death and old age and 
when when the time comes and so get there. <laughs> And I see, I see a question uh, from um, Elizabeth Graver here about folklore and how it's influenced your fiction. But I want to go a little step back before that, if I may, actually, and just to ask you about folklore. I think for a lot of people out there, folklore is little fairy tales that they heard as children and it's been left behind. But, but the role of folklore in your life, I can almost actually ask, or let's say in the cultural life of Ireland, before we speak about it actually within the fiction, in, in, in which you have so wonderfully threaded it. Let me just talk about it. What was your fascination with folklore in the first place, I guess, might be a question. Well, again, I came to folklore um, in an academic context, mm. Um, mm. really um, because, like most people, I would have thought, yeah, folklore is you know about leprechauns and things, which it is actually partly, but um, <laughs> it's... Let's, let's not forget the leprechaun. It's not the only thing. And, um, so uh, without giving my very long lecture about how I came to Irish folklore, um, when I was a student of medieval English, um, uh, a, prof a professor called Boo Alkris came from Sweden to Ireland to set up folklore in UCD. And um, I remember my pr the professor of Old English, Father Dunning, said to me, Ailish, you'll be interested in this because your name is an Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Such stereotypes. Of course, you're kind of, you know, you're interested in folklore. You're away your with the fairies already, so that's what you say. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of thing. <laughs> so, but it was true, really. And um, I, I, I suppose it means I could access, I could read the, the, the yeah. manuscript because I knew Irish. Um, but that, that, then I discovered that in Ireland, in in UCD, even uh, um, it, the archive is still there. We have this fantastic, huge archive full of uh, stories and legends and oral history and everything you can think of and um, collected by the Irish Folklore Commission and collectors of the Department of Irish Folklore over um, several decades. And that this... Um, it, and, you know, I, I because the course I was doing was the folktale and medieval literature, I saw how the roots of literature are, of course, in the oral tradition. Chaucer uses stories that he heard all the time for the Canterbury Tales. And um, um, I got completely involved in it. And, you know, written literature is, uh, as my husband used to always say, this is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Right, I mean, right, people, oral right. literature was there for right, um, right. 30, we don't, in fact, you know, we don't really know when people started to talk, but right. um, we can um, posit at least uh, 30,000 years or so that, that people were telling stories. Right. Um, right. So right. they are doing that for a very, very long time before they start talking. So um, before they start writing, and, and what they usually start writing is... Um, well, law tracts and um, accounts, but then stories <laughs> that they've heard. Right. But a whole story. world out there, a whole different universe from the one that we inhabit actually available. Oh, you mean in the, in in the, the world of the humanist, the, the, the sort yeah, of the uh, beliefs and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, yes. But, well, there are many different aspects to, to what, what it is. And I guess I was particularly interested in um, folk, folk stories. Um, but yeah, um, the, in, 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 in Ireland in the past, it, it is true that people um, believed in the fairies. Um, that they inhabited the real real world, but that the the veil is separating um, our ordinary world and the supernatural world was was, was very thin right. and could be lifted um, at any moment. As it is, of course, and it was a world that, yeah. as, as people like Angela Burke point out, it was a world that actually had a really direct impact upon the ordinary lives of people as they went about their daily business. Angela Burke has written very well about this in, um, say, The Burning of Bridget Cleary and in uh, many of her articles. Um, and uh, in fact, she was an influence on me, I have to say, in, you know, ways of interpreting sure, um, sure. these legends like Midwives sure. to Fairies um, sure. and, and so on. 
that sure. um yeah 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 it had an impact on people as they went about their lives yeah and I, I want to uh, I've got I want to continue actually with the actual question from Elizabeth here indeed which which talks about folklore and 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 fairies uh, folklore excuse me and and fiction but I think that maybe we're going to open up are we here to to everybody can we open up to um to allow everybody in supposedly as panelists so that we can all actually see each other. But going back to why people do that, I'm going to just continue with Elizabeth's question, which was that how your work in folklore has actually influenced your fiction, either formally or in terms of the subject matter or both. Are there other fiction writers, she wonders, who draw on these traditions that you admire? I mean, what you're doing is so powerful. I mean, it's not just magic realism, it's something different. And I think the question from Elizabeth there is really rather lovely. Um, there, yeah, well, there are um, three bits to the question. Do other writers do it? Um, Nolan Egonel has done it, the, uh -huh. done it quite a lot. Um, mm. Well, Nola is a pioneer almost in this, right. with being a drawing on um, folklore, our, our great Irish language poet. Um, Otherwise, um, not that many people, I think it's true to say, are, are doing this in Irish um, literary, uh, Irish writers. Um, mm. Icelandic writers do it a great deal, apparently. Um, uh, that's another culture where um, the, the belief in, um, in the supernatural, in uh, fairies and so on, uh, is, is quite strong. And they draw on it in their, even in their, um, their detective novels and so on. And um, has it influenced my writing? Yes, it has. Um, I, 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 again, I initially I was reluctant um, to, to use folk tales or legends in my writing um, because we had a very purist attitude to it. I didn't want to mess around with the, um, with the with the stories or the legends that um, other narrators had told, you know, what kind of thought they belonged to them. But then I got over that and started using them. And um, I've I've used them in terms of content in that um, I have in various stories um, used a legend to counterpoint a, a contemporary story, which seems right. to be about the same thing as right. in my story, right. Midwife to the Fairies, where right. I interweave right. a, a legend with um, a kind of more modern version, you could say, of the same uh, type of um, story. Um, in terms of form and structure, I have used it on, um, certainly when I'm writing um, novels uh, for young people i always bear in mind the fairy tale pattern of um mm. you know um uh, russian folklorist eliezer melchinsky says all fairy tales begin with the breakup of one family and end with the establishment of the other the fairy tales are really about children growing from adolescent mm -hmm. moving from childhood to adulthood you know at the beginning of the story a boy is tossed out of home by an evil stepmother or something at the end he's you know he's slain the dragon he's won the princess he's setting up a uh, home in a in a in a castle so and he's he's overcome various obstacles which you can interpret to rep interpret to represent the Are kind that. of um challenges that adolescents and young people so face. deep powerful so, so that, that 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 sort of deep structure that is the structure of the 19th century novel anyway so it's not just i'm not the only one who would be drawing on it but i'm kind of conscious of it because yeah. i have studied right. folklore. <laughs> Not just drawing upon it, but you inter you're interweaving it. That, that's what you're doing rather differently, I think. And that's what makes much of your writing so gorgeous. And we've barely spoken about your, your writing for children, which is what which is one of the things that you're most known for here. I'm, I'm, before I go back to that, actually, I just see a question from uh, Patrick Mullen. And um, I hope you want to ask it yourself. Or I'll, I'll ask, I'll, I'll speak it for you, Patrick, actually. Any thoughts you wonder about Lady Gregory's visions and beliefs? Uh, what did you think of her work with that collection? This is Lady Gregory, of course, I mean, who the great influence upon upon Yeats and the great woman in her own right and and playwright in her own right, actually, at the time. She seems, Patrick thinks, to his mind, to have been neglected compared to Yeats. And that collection 
he thinks feels very compelling. Do you have an opinion on that? Well, I, 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 I can't uh, comment uh, immediately on the, that particular collection, but Lady, Lady Gregory is um, was a good collector of um, of folklore um, of, of, of of tales. She. Um, she she knew Irish. Um, she unlike Yeats, um, she was uh, she she her 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 collections of of, of folklore are um, probably uh, mm, more useful and more authentic um, than mm. Ye- Yeats. I mean, Ye- Yeats did publish in his early days um, a few collections of folk tales. Um, but he he usually drew them. He, he he did it to make money, which is not a bad reason for doing anything, obviously. But um, I mean, he went to the British Library and and copied stories from other collections that Patrick Kennedy and nineteenth uh, Croft and Croker and nineteenth uh, century Irish collectors had had had. Um, had published, whereas Lady Gregory was out in the field. Yates, Yates went out into the field with her, but um, she, she did a lot of, um, you know, or the kind of collecting, I suppose, that we were still were doing in the in the 20th century with the Irish Folklore Commission. Um, yeah, so I, she, yeah, well, Yates, Lady Gregory, she, she's she's neglected, of course, up to a point, but I mean, everyone is neglected by comparison with W.B. Yates. So. Must have been difficult to work from under <laughs> the shadow of Yates. He's a giant. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, Mike, have you got particular questions or shall I go? I think there are one or two more here. Uh, I see Patsy Murphy. Sorry. There. Patsy yeah, Murphy. Sorry. Yes, sorry. I was going to read and, that as music. Uh, sorry, do you think that women writers as, uh, such as Marion Lavin or Eilish Dillon are not mentioned or much republished because of the time in which they were writing? Yeah, it, well, it, 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 they, it, it, would, it would be good if they got more attention. Um, I mean, they were very um, eminent and famous in their day. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean... It, and Mary Lavin was a short story writer. It is the fate of most writers to be um, out of print. Um, as somebody who was a librarian in the National Library knows, um, the, the stacks of uh, forgotten writers are rather enormous. Um, and it's chastening um, as a writer to, 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 to walk through them and see all the names that nobody remembers. But... Um, and I wouldn't classify Mary Lavin, say, in that category, or Eilish Dillon, maybe either. But um, you know, Frank O'Connor. To be fair, like, what about Frank O'Connor and Sean of Whalon? Do we see much of them around? No, we do not. Um, so, um, and you know, these were big writers, very famous. The New Yorker, everyone reading them, and out of print. Right. <laughs> okay, people are rising and 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 and, and, whatever it does. and we're coming towards the end of our time here Eilish. I, i'm going to ask you actually i mean if you can if you can dare to actually to predict the future um I, let's say i just wonder what what this what this moment is going to produce if we look back in a generation or two generations time in this singular event let's hope singular event in the history of the world What's it going to do to writers? What might emerge from it? Is there any kind of silver lining there that you hope young writers, old writers, people will be able to gather from this? And is anything new going to emerge from it? Do you hope? Can we hope? Yes, new writing will emerge from it. I, I, I would think so. Um, I mean, I, I would look at something like the pandemic as a setting rather than subject matter yeah. you know I, I people used to say about the Celtic Tiger oh, why, do, why don't Irish writers write about the Celtic Tiger and actually of course you can always say well yes various writers did write about it you just haven't read them um, and especially short story writers who can kind of catch the moment um, more easily than, than novelists uh on the hop, as it were, um, but um, I, I would think the um, pandemic will 
give writers time to reflect on right. what is really important for them right. as, as it does for all of us. So um, I'd be interested to see. And, you know, I mean, people in my, of my generation are experiencing this in one way, but I can hardly imagine how somebody in their 20s is experiencing it. I would imagine in a much more dramatic way right. and that they will have plenty to write about. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we can look forward to some some grand things coming out of this. Uh, before we finish, I want to thank very much, of course, uh, Mike Rona for always being for being marvellous. And for Peter Zogby, who I haven't pointed out to before, in fact, who does actually great technological work here and, and allows us to overcome some of the little barriers that occasionally arise. And everybody else, I see so many lovely names there of people um, who I've seen before and who often join us here and people whom I haven't seen before. Thank you all very, very much for coming. It's been really great seeing you there. I'm sorry we didn't have time to go through some of the other questions that are out there, but I want to thank Eilish, our Burn Scholar again this year, for being absolutely marvellous and, and for promising so much, for saying so, 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 so many beautiful and important things to us. Good luck with your writing in the future, Eilish. Lovely to have you in Boston. And thank you, everybody, for being with us. We're back next week. But before I finish, let's just turn to Mike for one second. Mike, who can the people expect next week? Okay, so it's ne next week is uh, a wonderful woman that may, many people consume but don't know who she is. Uh, her name's Susan Kirby, and she's actually the CEO of the St. Patrick's Day Festival. So she is the woman who puts the parade on the street in Dublin, runs a five-day-long festival in normal circumstances, but then also spends a kind of 11 to 10 months between times promoting the festival, the idea of St. Patrick's uh, Parade, St. Patrick's Celebration, around the world, been involved with greening of the buildings around the world, etc., etc. So she is the power uh, behind St. Patrick's Day. So really, if you want to understand uh, how kind of Ireland, in a way, commodifies itself, how it thinks about itself, how the festival reflects what it is to be Irish, both here and around the world, then next week, uh, 4.30 American time, 9.30 Irish time. Look, maybe we should, unless there's anybody's got particular questions or anything, maybe we should actually start to... Okay, well, lovely to see um, my my friends and from Ireland and Bulgaria and um, Boston. Uh, so really, really appreciated that you and Cork, of course, not forgetting Cork, um, came came along. Lovely, so. loads of new friends from Boston. I've never seen out Irish, yeah. and even more of them coming. Thanks very much, okay. everybody. Thanks, 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 so happy Thanks. Halloween. Thank you. Thank you Bye. so much.